Welcome to our worship service this evening on this night before Thanksgiving. We are here to give thanks to God for he is good and his mercy endures forever. We begin with an opening of thanks. Uh, we have you read your part and then we'll sing together our parts. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faithfulness and mercy you have shown us. Once again, you have blessed our farms and gardens with seed time and harvest. over us wherever we are and constantly protect us with your angels even in troubles you have never forsaken us blessings you give to our souls. In your faithfulness you have provided a Savior. Through Jesus we find perfect forgiveness and the promise of heaven. You have called us to faith by the Holy Spirit, and you feed our souls with your word and sacraments. And we never fail to thank and praise you for these and all your blessings. God our Father, your generous goodness comes to us new every day. By the work of your Spirit, lead us to acknowledge your goodness, give thanks for your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson this evening is written in Paul's letter to the Philippians. The occasion here is that Paul had received offerings from them, and so he was thanking them for the offerings that they had given to him. And he's telling them, sometimes he had a little, sometimes he had a lot, but he learned the secret of contentment, and so he tells us what that is. I rejoice greatly in the Lord now that you have revived your concern for me once again. Actually, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I lack anything. In fact, I have learned to be content in any circumstances in which I find myself. I know what it is to live in humble circumstances, and I know what it is to have more than enough. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, while being full or hungry, while having plenty or not enough. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. This is our first lesson. 
We'll sing the verses that are in the bowl. written in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. We begin with, read, with, begin reading with verse 25. Uh, Thanksgiving <clears throat> is trusting God, trusting that he will continue to bless us and be with us. And so Jesus here talks about that, putting our trust in him so we do not have to be afraid or worry. <clears throat> For this reason I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food in the body, more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Which of you can add a single moment to his lifespan by worrying? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not labor or spin, but I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was dressed like one of these. Now if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not clothe you even more? You have little faith. So do not worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For the unbelievers chase after all these things. Certainly your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is our gospel lesson. Let's read the response together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. May we see it and we'll sing our next hymn.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. The word of God that we look at tonight is taken from Acts 14. In Lystra there was a man who was sitting down because he had no strength in his feet. He had never walked because he was lame from birth. When he was listening to Paul as he was speaking, Paul looked at him closely and saw that he had faith to be healed. Paul said in a loud voice, Stand up on your feet. And the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lycaonian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the main speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and garlands to the city gates because he wanted to offer sacrifices along with the crowds. But when the apostles Paul and Barnabas heard about this, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing these things? We too are men with the same nature as you. We are preaching the good news to you so that you turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without testimony of the good he does. He gives you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He fills you with food and fills your hearts with gladness. Even though they said these things, they had a hard time stopping the crowds from sacrificing to them. This is the word of God. May be seated. Dear friends in Christ, over the years there have been many famous trials that have grabbed the attention of our nation. I did a little Google search, but you don't have to do a Google search to try and figure out what's number one, right? The O.J. Simpson murder trial back in 1994 went on for 11 months, it said, and there's all that drama in the courtroom, and then there's a whole thing with the glove and it didn't fit. Some other famous trials, Timothy McVeigh, who was convicted of the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, Stephen Avery from Manitowoc, all the drama around that whole thing, he's in jail, he's out, he's back in jail, Netflix made a whole series about him and whether he really did commit that murder. Then we just had one just a few weeks ago down in Kenosha that the whole nation was watching of course, the most famous trial of all time is the one we just talked about last week, Jesus before Pontius Pilate on trial for his life. There's probably hundreds, maybe thousands of courtroom trials that are fictional, that are in the movies or in books or in TV shows. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, that one popped up. That's an old, old classic the trial in there. The Cain Mutiny, I'm showing my age, but... I remember that was made into a movie starring Humphrey Bogart as the captain that lost his marbles literally and figuratively because he was always playing with his marbles. But the first in command took over control of the ship from the captain and faced court martial. So that's another famous one. And then there's the one where Jack Nicholson yells at Tom Cruise, you can't handle the truth. A few good men. So trials, they're drama and they grab our attention. In a way, we could say there's a trial that goes on in people's minds every day as they think about the question, is God good or is God bad? And they consider the evidence in their own mind. They look at things in their own mind, and then they come up with a conclusion. Is God good or is he bad? This is especially true at Thanksgiving time, because at Thanksgiving time, we gather together and we give thanks to God for all the goodness it has given us over the past year, and we think of all of those blessings, but then we ask ourselves, well, what if God hasn't been good to us this past year? What if I had a bad year? Then is God really good? Or is he not so good? And so I got thinking about this, and I chose this text from Acts because Paul uses the word testimony or witness, depending on how you want to translate it, when he talks about God giving testimony or witness of his goodness. And I thought, not to be blasphemous, but that we could put God on trial here tonight and see if he is a good God or a bad God. A little background here. 
So Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey. They're traveling through Asia Minor, which today is Turkey, and they come to this town of Lystra. And they're preaching the good news about Jesus. And Paul sees this man who was lame from birth, not able to walk, and so he heals him. The crowd is excited. They think that they're gods, mythical gods who have come down to earth, and the god of, or the high priest of Zeus gets some, some bulls and some garlands, and they're offer sacrifices because they didn't want to to be in trouble with the gods for not giving them a proper reception. And so they're offering, want to offer this sacrifice. And when Paul and Barnabas figure out what's going on, well, they're just horrified because now they're worshiping to them, which is blasphemy. And so they go running through the crowds and they tear their clothes and don't do this. We are people just like you are people. You shouldn't worship these worthless things. You should worship the true living God because he has given testimony of his goodness. So what is that testimony? of his goodness. Let's consider the evidence. And so our theme for tonight is the trial of a lifetime. Is God good? And with any trial, it starts out with the prosecuting attorney going first, right? The prosecution goes first. And so tonight, right now, I'll be the prosecuting attorney. Okay, and I'm going to give my opening statement my opening statement is this. Men and women of the jury, and that's you guys, you are the men and women of the jury. God has shown himself to be a very crafty God because over hundreds, thousands of years, he has convinced people that he is really good. But the evidence that I will present to you tonight shows that he is not good, that he is in fact a bad guy. And so I would like to call my first witness. Okay, so, here's the witness stand here. I call my first witness and I say, state your name and tell us who you are. Okay, so now I'm the witness. <coughs> my name is George. And I think God is a bad guy. I'll tell you why in one word. COVID. I know we're all sick of hearing about COVID and we're sick of dealing with COVID, but COVID has ruined my life. When that shutdown came way back in March, a year and a half ago, we were stuck at home, my wife and I, and we were both in the service industry, so we lost our jobs because there was none of that going on. We were not able to visit our kids and our grandkids, and so it was driving us crazy. And then we both got COVID, and my wife nearly lost her life. She came this close to it. And so I know that, you know, maybe God didn't send this, but it doesn't look like he's doing anything to stop it. And so I don't think God is a very good guy. Okay, thank you, George. You can step down. And I'll call my next witness. State who you are and what you think of God. My name is Sally. I don't think God is a very good God because my two girls and I are homeless right now. My husband left us, and he's supposed to be making payments, but he's not, and so we were not really able to pay all the bills with just my job that I have, and so the bills are piling up, and I'm trying to do more and make more. I tried to get a second job, but I wasn't able to do all of them at once, and so I lost both jobs, and now we're living in our car. And there's a restaurant down the street that offers us table scraps, and once in a while we get something from the food pantry, but if God is a good God, then why is my life like this? Well, thank you, Sally. You can step down. We'll call one more witness to the stand. Tell us who you are and what you think of God. Well, my name is Joe. And I'm a police officer, and because of that, I've seen it all. I've seen the horrible things that people do to other people, the violence and the crimes and the abuse and the drugs and the stealing and even murder, I've seen it all. And, and you wonder why does God let that go on? And Christmas is coming up. It's supposed to be the time of peace and harmony for one another, but it's not. At Christmas time, people get all selfish and grouchy and it 
only makes it worse. If God is a good God, I don't really see it. Well, thank you, George. Thank you for your testimony. And so now in my closing statement, I could say you, we could call witness after witness after witness and they would tell you the same thing, how their lives are a mess or all the trouble that is happening to them in their life. But now I turn it back on you and you look at your life and what is going on in your life and what was 2021 for you? Was it some sadness or some trials in your life? And so there you have it. Is God really a good God? I rest my case. And so now, the defense attorney gets his time to talk. And so the defense attorney says, men and women of the jury, the prosecuting attorney has done a good job of presenting his case, even though he sounds a lot like the devil. The evidence that I will show you, that I present to you, will show you that God is indeed a good God. And I'm not going to call people to be witnesses, but I'm going to go a different way and call different witnesses. And the first witness I call is the Apostle Paul, who says this, Men, why are you doing these things? We too are men with the same nature as you. We are preaching the good news to you so that you can turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the sea, the earth, and everything in them. In past generations he allowed all the nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without testimony of the good he does. He gives you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He fills you with food and fills your heart with gladness. Now a lot of times when Paul came into a town as he was traveling on his missionary journeys, there was a synagogue there and there were Jewish people there and so he had a base from which to start. Jewish people who were familiar with the Old Testament God and the prophecies of the Old Testament. So he would start there and introduce them to Jesus as the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. Now here in Lystra apparently there was not that, that they had no clue as to who the true God is. And so he went back to the very basics, back to creation and how God created the earth and the sea and everything that is in it. And then he went to the testimony of God and his goodness. He fills you with food and fills your hearts with gladness. He, he gives you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. And so all these things are a witness or a testimony that God is good. Reminds us of what God said to Noah when he came out of the ark. He promised him, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And so every cornfield is a witness that God is good. Every bean field or every grain field is a witness that God is good. Every sunset and every drop of rain is a witness that God is good. And tomorrow when we gather around our table with our families or our friends and we have all this food to eat, all of this is a witness to us that our God is good to us. Now at this time, the prosecuting attorney pipes up and says, Objection! You have not really answered the question. Sure, you talk about God being good and He creating the world and giving us food, but you haven't answered the question, if God is good, then why all this trouble in the world? And the judge says, objection sustained. You may answer the question. And so now the defense attorney says, well, thank you. I'm glad you asked that question. Because there's some things we can say here. First of all, we can say that all the trouble and all the hardship in this world and the blame for all of that does not lie at the feet of God. God created the world to be a perfect place. And all the mess that this world is in is a result of sin in the world and bad people doing bad things and sinful people doing sinful things. Now God could stop all of that, and at the end of the world he will, but he has decided not to do that yet. And in the meantime, he gives us the strength to get through that and as we go through that, and he gives us the strength, and he strengthens us and works that out for our good. The other thing we could say in view of all of this, 
is that God does not have to defend himself to anyone, does he? Yes, we have framed this whole sermon tonight in a trial, in the form of a trial, because of that word witness or testimony, but God is not on trial by us. Whether we think that he's good or bad, or whether we come to the verdict that he is good or bad, doesn't change who he is. God is good. And if people don't see that God is good, it's just that they're not seeing that he is good. Does water have to prove that it is wet? No, it's just wet, right? Does ice have to prove that it is cold? It's just cold. Do the rotten eggs have to prove that they stink? They just stink. And so if you're outside and it starts to rain, you can either put up your umbrella or you can get wet. The choice is yours. You can look at God and what he does and you can think he's good or bad, but God is still good. We gave the witness of the Apostle Paul. We could call more and more and more witnesses. Outside of the town of Bethlehem, an angel appeared in the sky and said, I bring you good news of great joy, for unto you in the city of David a Savior has been born, he is Christ the Lord. And that angel is a witness of how good God is and how much he loves us. And then there was a whole choir of angels in the sky singing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And all those angels are witnesses of how good and gracious God is and how much he loves us. Now that little baby grew up to be Jesus, and at one point we hear him say, I am the good shepherd, because I love my sheep, and I might lay down my life for the sheep. The hired hand runs away, because he doesn't care about them, but I lay down my life for the sheep, because I love them. And these words of the good shepherd are a witness of how much he loves us. And then we see this man, Jesus, in an upper room with his disciples, and he's going to die the next day, and so that's on his mind, but he's also thinking about his disciples and what is going to happen to them after he's gone, and so he says to them, don't be afraid, don't be troubled, just trust in me. And I'm going to go, prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and take you to be with me in my father's home. And those words are a witness how much God loves us and how good he is to us. And then a little later, he is out in the garden. He's praying, if it's possible, Father, take that suffering away from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. I'll suffer. And those words are a witness of how much God loves us and how good he is. And then there's three crosses out on a hill outside of Jerusalem. And from the middle cross, we hear, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We hear, today you'll be with me in paradise. We hear, John, here's your mother. Mother, here's your son. And those words are a witness to how good God is. And then, toward the end, we hear him say with a loud voice, it is finished. And we know that we therefore now have no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And those words are a witness to God's grace and mercy to us. And then outside the city, there's a tomb and it's empty. And there's an angel saying, why are you here? Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. And that angel witnesses to how good God is. And then at one point, the pastor poured water on our head and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and we became children of God. And those words witness to us that our God is good. And frequently, the Lord comes to us and says, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you and here's my blood which I poured out for you. And those words are a witness. And then we look at Revelation and we hear about 10,000 times 10,000 of angels around the throne saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and honor and glory and strength. And those millions of angels, each one of those millions of angels is a witness that God is good and that he loves us. Yes, we have hardships and trials in our life, but our God loves us so much he gave his only son for us. And our Savior loves us so much, he gave his life for us. And we could call witness after witness after witness, but 
you see God's love. And I rest my case. And so, today we are here to praise God and give glory to Him and honor to Him because of how good He is for us. Amen. That's right. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith. We'll read together the fourth petition from the Catechism. Give us today our daily bread. What does this mean? God surely gives daily bread without our asking, even to all the wicked. But we pray in this petition that he would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. What then is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything that we need for our bodily welfare, such as food and drink, clothing and shoes, house and home, land and cattle, money and goods, a godly spouse, godly children, godly workers, godly and faithful leaders, good government, good weather, peace and order, health, a good name, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. And the choir will sing for us for the autumn sky.
We praise thee, O God, our Redeemer, Creator. In grateful devotion, our tribute we bring. We lay it before thee, we kneel and adore thee. We bless thy holy name. Glad praises we sing. Amen. Let's rise and pray. We'll pray the responsive prayer in the bulletin, and then we'll include in our prayers of prayer for Kevin Fluter and Sandy Driver, who are still in the hospital. Heavenly Father, when you open your hand, you satisfy the desires of every living thing. Today we remember with joy the gifts you provide for us. We thank you especially for the incomparable spiritual blessings you have given us through your Son. It is true that every good and every good gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heaven and earth. Yet we are greedy and ungrateful, we complain and worry. Forgive us for these and all our sins in the name of Jesus. Prevent our many blessings from becoming Satan's trap to ensnare us. At this Thanksgiving time, pour out your Spirit on us. Bless us with a faith that seeks first your kingdom and your righteousness. Assure us that you will supply all our other needs as well. Be with your people wherever they might be on this holiday. Protect those who are traveling. Cheer the hearts of the lonely and comfort those who sorrow. And look with compassion on the poor and needy. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for every day of health that you have given to Sandy and to Kevin, and for every measure of strength that you have given their body and mind. And now we come before you in their hour of suffering, asking you to mercifully restore their health and their strength. We pray that you would be with the doctors who are attending them and bless their healing. We dare to ask this of you sinners, though we are, because Jesus died for us, and is for his sake, and in his name that we ask these blessings of you, and in his name we also join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace.
Once again, welcome. We're glad you could join us for our service tonight. Um, some thank yous to the choir for singing for us. Also for the family of Wesley Schultz for the, the flowers on the altar this evening. Um, Sunday would have been his 90th birthday, so we're thankful for those flowers. And uh, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing tomorrow, have a blessed Thanksgiving.